as part of the summer school because actually um, we had our first ever critical neuroscience workshop just next door at Thompson House five years ago. Um, so it's, it's nice to be back and since then we've done, we've had a few conferences, a few workshops, we've taught a few graduate courses in Europe and in North America and each time I think it draws a slightly different group of people, slightly different disciplines and looking at looking at the list today it looks like a really mixed group of people which is always interesting for us because we get to deepen certain areas of the project and push questions in in different um, directions. Um, so the objective with um, the workshop and the project in general at this point is really to try and understand what is going on in neuroscience. What what's happening with the pace of developments, the production of huge amounts of data, how are these data <coughs> circulating, what are they being applied to. Um, so how, how are we to make sense of what's going on with the changes in, in technologies, with the methodological issues that we hear little bits about, the scandals that went through the community in the last couple of years, and how, what, are they, what are the findings actually pointing to, how significant are they? Um, and as you know, in the last few years, there's been the growth of disciplines like um, neuroethics, and then I guess what's loosely or collectively called the social studies of neuroscience, and also smaller, smaller projects like biohumanities and then critical neuroscience itself. So there seems, there seems to be um, definitely a need, but perhaps an opening at the moment to think more reflectively about what's happening in neuroscience and around neuroscience. Um, in fact, I was talking to Alan Young the other day, who can't be here, unfortunately, till the last, till the final day when he'll give a talk. Um, and he, he was talking about his experiences and his observations at the ENSN, the European, the European Network for Neuroscience and Society, is that right? Yeah. Um, the final conference of the ENSN happened a month or two ago in Europe, and um, maybe some of you were, were there. And he was saying the same thing. He was sort of observing a similar feeling that um, people were able to talk about the challenges in neuroscience. And also among people that you wouldn't really expect, people were being a little bit more open about what the problems might be, both inside the community and around it. Um, for example, he was talking about Professor Stephen Hyman, the former director of the National Institutes for Mental Health, who was really openly talking about um, doubts, uncertainties for the role of cognitive neuroscience, specifically for its role in psychiatry. Um, so the question then for the next four days really is then how do we make sense of what's going on inside neuroscience and how should we make sense of all the many discourses about neuroscience? By way of introduction to some of the questions that we're going to address, um, I want to show you a short video clip that our very serious, rigorous neuroscientist colleague over here sent a couple of days ago. Um, and the reason is, well, I'll tell you the reason after I, I play it. <laughs> Well, the, uh, the Cots and the Tempertonis murk the group poses and overclock the Murga chooses. There's to be discursive on and part of Isaac is together to mood celebrity and appendity, so forth, for shows dark division and auditory slow perfection. Resulting frictation induces corresponding blip mortalizers, but uh, that all comes under Corona's electroperiodic desultification, which you will underlies in our professor course. Now, resultory frictation and multicentric compulator superless the alleviating duds of medial level dutch, making contes and together to slip temperance and expectancy. A reflection inertia corresponds to Hugo Bavertz's supercreditly balanced multiparatory equation, E equals 2R. I'll say that again, E equals 2R, where R is the radius of a home measure of the Valdor effect. Now, providing the pervenary stems of parabolic and paracelton, reflector recidity overleases the home of Isri and hetero Valdor effect, so that neglectance of Mermat's atmospheric supercontraction causes struct dimension of faction cavity there. 
So don't eat them. Um, so, so the reason I showed it to you, I, I find John Cleese very funny, but it's really, it captures the cliched image of the neuroscientist, the white-coated man talking about the, describing the structures and functions of, of the brain using his plastic model, um, using these long Latin words, albeit in this case, total gobbledygook. Um, so, so we all know this image of the neuroscientist just doesn't hold up anymore. The neuroscientist is not the white-coated lab bench scientist. In fact, the new neuroscientist occupies a very different space and has a really different role. I don't, I don't know if you can see that so clearly, but this, this is an image from the front page of the Institute of Contemporary Arts. So the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London um, it was set up in the, you probably know it, it was set up in the 40s by writers and artists to house experimental arts. It's an institution that identifies itself as a home of, uh, yeah, one of, a home of the British avant garde. Um, anyway, so the ICA now hosts a neuroscient neuroscientist in residence. This is the first, um, a friend and very interesting colleague, Daniel Glazer who held the position of the neuroscientist in residence in 2002. So interestingly, and unlike the John Cleese um, stereotype, where you would go now to listen to a post-punk band or a new DJ or see some interesting new installation, you can now also listen to a cognitive neuroscientist present data and talk to you about models um, of volition, of the self, addiction, uh, these kinds of things. The new neuroscientist also advises governments and organizations globally about the role of neurotechnologies in, in business, uh, in defense, social policy. You might recognize Zach Lynch here, the author of Neurorevolution. I think it's called Neurorevolution, How Brain Science is Changing Our Worlds. So here he is in Dubai giving a talk about neuroscience. Um, and on the right, can't really see it very clearly, but um, the new neuroscientist like Baroness Susan Greenfield is interviewed in the Guardian's Life and Style column. So the Life and Style is usually reserved for musicians, celebrity writers and chefs. Um, and now we have Susan Greenfield talking about herself and probably the dangers of various things to children's brains. Um, we also have Hollywood celebrities themselves these days talking about neuroscience. Um, here is an example, a short clip from a TED talk, Goldie Horn doing a TED Med talk. Now, this is a group of children who I'm sure are not bad children, but they have lost empathy. They don't understand where their empathy is, what they care about, what matters to them, who matters to them. So therefore, the other part of the section of this is their place in terms of understanding themselves in the world. So our section is all about perspective taking, role changing. This is also part of what we do. In case we also look at acts of kindness, what they can do to help others. And what we're learning and what the kids are learning is that everything that they are actually doing in the classroom has a brain link. Because what happens to your brain when you do something wonderful for somebody, the same thing that happens to them in the giving happens to you in the receiving and vice versa. It's a wonderful emission of dopamine. Dopamine is a terrific neurotransmitter. We love to do our dopamine dances in class because we know these are the ways to support well-being and productivity. So we then took mindful senses. So we have four sections. We have mindful senses, your place in the, in, in the universe, in your society, uh, quieting the mind, and understanding the brain. We then um, OK, so one of the questions that we can explore over the next four days then is how is it that neuroscience and neuroscientists have come to have this role? From scientists that describe structures and functions of the brain to experts who prescribe how to live according to this evidence from the brain. Um, we'll also talk about how everyday people, teachers, therapists, parents, patients, children, 
take up languages of neuroscience and what work these kinds of vocabularies do for them. Um, we'll talk in this session actually about the philosophical frameworks that critical neuroscience itself has drawn from um, and we'll try and ask the question of how, how to do critique as it were. Um, we're going to have some group work sessions as you might have noticed in the afternoons and Jan will speak a bit more about this in a minute but um, we'll use some of that group work time to think about how to flesh out this question of being critical. Um, and meanwhile, it'll be important to keep in mind uh, and pay attention to the antagonisms as well as the tensions, um, the, as well as the appeal, sorry, of the new interdisciplinarity that sort of frames all of this and the emergence of new neuro-X disciplines. Um, Critical neuroscience obviously has emphasized a commitment to engage with neuroscience while at the same time drawing on a whole host of other disciplines. But what should this engagement with neuroscience and the other disciplines look like? So this is a, a, a rough scheme of contributing activity to critical neuroscience on a first level where we think of it as a broad contextualization of the neurosciences in their context. And of course, neuroscience in the singular is misleading. It's a vast universe of different disciplinary approaches with different histories, different methodologies, different theories. Um, of course, also different um, really di disciplinary traditions. Just think of biology on the one side, psychology on another side, then uh, philosophy or neurophilosophy, um, and of course, computer science, all these, uh, this whole um, data gathering and evaluation procedures that we have today are unthinkable without sophisticated information technologies. And so all this comes together to form this, this new uh, techno science. And critical neuroscience in the first instance is seeking a contextualization and an understanding of, of what is going on here, how neuroscience works, what comes together to, to solidify into this field, um, and of course, what is where they're coming from, what are the institutions that uh, support it, what are the funders, what are the meaning-giving backstories uh, that inform neuroscientific approaches. And then, of course, the domains in which neuroscientific knowledge is applied these days in society, in politics, how the media takes up what goes on. And, uh, of course, there are various practical domains in society in which neuroscientific knowledge seems to be... Um, on the verge of being appropriated, if that's possible at this point, at least there are these visions of where it might go in the courtroom, in military, in education, um, of course in the clinic and in various other domains. Um, so that's one part of it and then of course we try to have um, on various levels projects that concretize these reflections. So on the one end, Tupana told about that, there is this neural revolution as something that is floated in the media, in popular culture, and it's sometimes you can really have a sense of a stark discrepancy between what is claimed by the pundits like Zach Lynch and others on what's going on here, and on the other hand, seeing the rather mundane reality of the actual research where you think that although it's exciting and although we have made advances here, you can say that the export value of neuroscientific findings as of now is rather limited. So you, you can't really say that there are applications that are ready for use in various areas. It's, it's, it's not the case. So in a way, the rhetorics runs ahead of the actual development um, of, of the science and the technologies. And so there's a, there's a variety of pro possible projects here. Of one, another one is neuro policies. Why it seems that there is this very close link um, between popular neuroscience and concrete policy, even despite the fact that we are still waiting for powerful applications. So why is it that, that politicians seem to be eager to learn from neuroscience and to, to frame um, social policy measures according to findings from neuroscience, or at least um, project to do so? There were huge government initiatives, for instance, in Britain, but also in France and Germany, that basically have neuroscience take the lead in initiatives of monitoring um, the mental health of the population, um, learning deficits in children, um, lifetime trajectories in various domains of, of personal um, um, properties, etc. And of course there's philosophy um, behind this, or there's their rather subtle processes in which um, neuroscientific uh, 
background knowledge somehow infiltrates our understanding of the mind of the person and it's usually a complex two-way exchange um, between uh, constructions of the self or the mind and natural scientific knowledge and of course this has a huge history a long history of naturalistic understandings of the person and um, there are various obvious ways in which philosophy can engage with this you have the typical anti-reductionist arguments that but that somehow seem a little powerless against the some of the cultural tendencies and we will talk about that and um, and on the other hand you have this enthusiastic embrace by several philosophers of neuroscience as the new way forward and I mean you might know people like the Churchlands or in Europe Thomas Metzinger who declare themselves neurophilosophers and who think that the whole spectrum of philosophical issues surrounding personhood and the mind is reframed by findings from neuroscience and there are really is really a metaphysics around the neuro and somewhat in between these extremes um, we think there is space for a well, a balanced cultural philosophy of neuroscience. And um, we can do a little bit in this direction in the group work. And um, I, I think I talk a little bit about that. We have handouts prepared. Should we pass them around now? Sure. Yeah, I think it's, it's the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, so they, the idea is that we work a little bit to, together on various issues that are important here and um, we have suggestions for three working groups on these sheets but of course this is open for um, for debate and negotiation we can we can of course change this a little bit and um, well the first working group will be it's of course an important question how to actually critique processes in neuroscience or elsewhere so what is the format the models of a critical engagement and um, Daniel will um, operate a group that looks at various ways in which neuroscientists themselves currently engage critical with their own field, the, own me the methods they employ, technical limitations, etc. And I think Daniel has a specific idea of a strategy that is probably not typical when you think um, of traditional European criticism uh, or the um, well, the political pessimism of the Frankfurt School, and 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 also the debunking attitude of many humanists vis-à-vis -vis, uh, scientific approaches. So Daniel has a, a rather different uh, template for critique here, which uses humor and irony um, in order to point to certain methodological flaws and developments and uh, challenge the community of neuroscientists to engage with that. And I think there are some working examples of this, and um, the group might want to engage with further ways of um, well, doing critique in an unconventional and probably more rhetorically um, appealing way also, of course, to those critiqued. And the other one, um, the other next group, group two, is one that rather looks at the cultural impacts of the neuro universe. And, um, well, we, we, we have called it sculpting the brain's cerebrality as a cultural framework. So, there is this this vague notion that a certain idea of neural functioning is increasingly operating in the social and cultural domains of society and somehow replacing former um, models of how to engage personhood. So it's, it's less about having a narrative self, it's less about authenticity, it's less about being able to narrate your life history, but now the brain somehow assumes um, dominance as something that causally determines all sorts of elements that pertain to a person and then of course the brain is something that can be trained, that can be optimized, that can be enhanced, that can be worked on in various ways and this somehow infiltrates um, understandings and also imperatives and, and normative outlooks of how a person should behave in these days and um, well this group could for instance look at various manifestations of this shift and assess whether there's indeed this shift happening and how it manifests in various areas of society. And the third group, that would be of course a, a, a great way forward when we actually could move closer to devising experiments, um, even neuroscientific experiments themselves, that somehow would be able to work against these limitations and uh, conceptual reductions that we often find in, in current research and ask whether we, we can actually put 
phenomenology experience, a social context, and um, these, these elements into experimental designs in neuroscience and how that actually could look like. And um, well, that would be really a, a, a step forward in terms of um, experimental approaches. And the groups convene this afternoon, and then we can see uh, um, how we divide up the class. And um, well, everybody can think about which of these three um, groups they want to join. Okay, I think now we start with... Some introductions? Yeah, finally, we start with the introductions yeah. of all of you. The, the project began when this so-called neurological turn was already well underway. Um, notions of personhood, of human nature, um, social interaction, mental illness, of course, were already being naturalized, or at least there was a sense that they were being naturalized through novel findings from neuroimaging data. Governments, uh, clinicians, educators, were already starting to advocate the use of neuroimaging data for initiatives that had kind of been um, sheltered from this kind of biological, or neurobiological framework till then. Um, but what was, what was taken for granted uh, in these emergent neurocultures, as they've been called, was the idea that these findings from neuroimaging labs held some kind of transformative potential that they had the ability to revolutionize even certain ways that we were living, that they would provide evidence of what mental illness really is, who, or rather what, selves are, and a basis to structure the arts and humanities and a framework to try and understand our experiences of things from uh, romantic love to the way that we should do psychotherapy. So it, there, was a, there was a sense then as well that if the science hadn't unlocked the answers to this then, then with the advancement of neurotechnologies, neuroimaging technologies, it soon would. So our primary aim at this point beca became to, to try to layer some empirical data over what seemed like some more abstract speculations about how neuroscience was really transforming um, our lives. And the idea was also to stop and take stock of the broader scheme of things, to situate neuroscience in a wider context and to look beyond neuroscience per se and to try and identify some of the bigger drivers behind the expansion of the neurosciences. So how did this all begin? Well, critical neuroscience started out as uh, a small group of interdisciplinary researchers in Berlin. Um, we started out being called Neuroscience in Context. Um, the aim, again, became to cut through the futuristic rhetoric, to cut through all the sense of promises and threats of what was going on, and to try to really develop an empirical analysis of the actual effects of neuroscience and what the appeal really was. Um, I, I want to make clear at the outset that neuroscience has always been taken seriously by critical neuroscience, partly because, as Lawrence mentioned, some of us are neuroscientists. Um, what was challenged and what is challenged is the primacy of neuroscience vis-a-vis uh, -vis other explanations and other discourses of human nature or mental illness, or culture, what have you. Um, there's, no, there's no doubt, obviously, that that we're much better off in our knowledge about the brain and, and the nervous system since the explosion of the brain sciences. But there are obviously loads of unresolved and pretty fundamental issues that um, are sort of being taken for granted as, as understood and resolved, not least the relationship between mind and the brain. Um, so, yeah, what we've been doing is trying to do the, a, a more empirically get grounded analysis of the speculative rhetoric around the neurosciences and to look beyond neuroscience at what is actually sustaining this so-called neurohype. And that sort of forces us to look at things like the changes in the university structure and in research bodies and what makes a neuro prefix for all these emerging areas of study and neurocultures, what makes a neuro prefix worth it, so to speak. Um, it also means looking at some of the uh, 
shifts within neuroscience and social neuroscience. In fact, the emergence of social neuroscience and cultural neuroscience, also epigenetics, and models of neuroplasticity that, that convey the notion of the brain as a site of transformation rather than a site of determination. So that somehow renders the fusion of neuroscience and um, whatever else, like these neurohumanities, neurosociology, neurotheology, um, there are books on neuropolitics. That renders the fusion more likely and the combination of understanding the epistemological shifts and also the shifts in the kind of university structure help us to really unpack what's driving the explosion of the neurosciences. I mentioned already that um, there seems to be a bit more of an opening um, to think critically and to scrutinize findings from neuroscience. And that's partly owing to some of the big things that happened in neuroscience in the last couple of years. Daniel can probably talk in detail um, in the afternoon or at some other point about some of these studies. These pictures you'll recognize because they refer to the paper previously known as the Voodoo Correlations paper, which um, highlighted some stati statistical issues in very high profile social neuroscience papers. And then there was the um, study, which you can just about make out there, of the neural correlates of perspective taking in a dead Atlantic salmon in a scanner. And there have since been other studies, important methodological issues being raised about, for example, the incredible variability between individuals in a group. So comparing groups can become problematic in fMRI studies because an individual taken to represent that group isn't actually very representative. Um, and we can talk about what the value of fMRI findings are, what some of the issues in the statistical questions are, um, what constitutes an ecologically valid experiment and all these things later. But for the moment, the question is, how, how can neuroscience or cognitive neuroscientists contribute to the critical project? Um, and how can practicing neuroscientists do something experimental that leads to critiquing the discipline or to critiquing some of the conceptual issues. So we can approach critical neuroscience then on two levels. Um, I've already really sort of described the first where we take neuroscience, this phenomenon of neuroscience as the target of critical reflection and ask how is it that it's come to have the status that it has. Um, but the second goal that Ian is charged with elaborating in the next session, the second goal has always been to try and understand how a more situated, um, nuanced understanding of the brain and the nervous system can matter, can be relevant to the humanities and vice versa. So how can the humanities sharpen models of cognition and behavior? What would measures, experimentally recorded measures in cognitive neuroscience, how can they contribute to richer theories of selfhood, identity, memory, emotions. Um, how, how can all these different vantage points intersect and start to interrogate each other, enrich each other, and what sorts of models will they end up developing? And how can we do all of this while working within a sort of a, a broader self-reflective framework that doesn't see human beings just as neurobiological, but that situates them in their cultural historical and institutional contexts. Um, so a few social theorists have suggested that we become neurologic subjects, that um, we are our brains or we're neurochemical selves, that we've entered an age of brainhood. Uh, somebody sent me this article the other day from the Hindu newspaper, which was really interesting, a, a tale of a grandfather trying to discipline his grandson, and he was using neurobiologically framed um, ideas to defend himself and to alleviate himself of some kind of responsibility. So these ideas that we are our brains are really far-reaching. But um, we'll discuss on Thursday in the subjectivities session whether it's really the case that we understand ourselves as brains at all, looking at various um, case studies. But if we do, as some have suggested, if we do think of ourselves as brains, and if we work on ourselves as brains, 
then what is it that makes that um, possible? What kinds of reasoning or styles of thought make that possible and sustain that way of thinking? So, in that sense, we see the work of being critical as unsettling certain things that seem self-evident, unsettling assumptions that seem below history, outside culture, outside politics, even ideas that, for example, that we are flexible selves or neuroplastic selves that can work on our individual brains, our emotional brains. How is it that these things have come about? Where do they come out of? And if we unsettle them, then it makes it possible to show how alternative models of cognition could have been and are still possible. You might have heard of this. This is uh, Charles Taylor's famous line that man is a self-interpreting animal. Charles Taylor, obviously, Montreal-based star philosopher. And, um, well, I, th I think it's quite obvious what this is. It means, it means that what we are is not independent entirely of what we take ourselves to be. And that distinguishes humans from other animals. Um, so that our self-understanding is more than just some sort of um, conceptual commentary that we give of ourselves, but something that runs deep, that is, is of course it's important in terms of moral outlooks, value systems, but also ways of life, ways of being that um, shape our life forms. And um, especially, of course, when, when this is not a, a talk, a discourse level, but something that is taken up in social institutions, implemented in practices, and when, it, when these interpretations really solidify and stabilize into what Foucault calls discourse, and Foucault meant by discourse not just talk, but of course the instrumentation, institutions, the solidity of um, um, a life world at a, given, at a given point in time. And we've heard already um, Ian Hacking's notion of making a people of looping effects, um, and that's basically the, the same kind of claim, that the makeup of human beings is not separable from historical and cultural processes. Who we are is co-constituted by situated self-interpretation in material and social settings. And as Lauren said, it's a kind of social niche construction. And um, what uh, these are processes that might sometimes start out with a kind of labeling from above, where a group of experts, be it uh, um, doctors, clinicians, uh, um, social um, politicians, uh, experts, uh, come up with kinds of label to sort people into different kinds. But then, of course, the um, persons thus classified take these labels up, shape them according to their own interpretation, then that's a feedback loop, so the, the category has to change um, accordingly. And of course, as Lauren said, it's a kind of process that you cannot strip entirely and, and just observe from the outside, as if from a God's eye perspective. So the, the whole skein of referrals of sense-making processes can only be encountered from an, a perspective that is in media's race. And it's uh, obvi no, often not, not obvious to see through the contingencies and historical uh, processes that shape these categories. And that's why I am um, a, a first, or the, the first process here that we need is um, raising awareness of contingencies of certain categories. And of course, the example from neuroscience would be that, that there is a tendency to establish types of person according to types of brains. Um, and, and then, of course, we have categories like the teenage brain, the depressed brain, the addicted brain, the criminal brain, and so on. And um, as, as we all know, these brain constructs are not really stable yet. But then, of course, you have social practices such as that in schools, kids are immediately monitored whether they display attentional abnormalities, et cetera, or um, even um, regular physicians diagnose depression or burnout as it is. I don't know, is burnout also a, a big thing here? In, in Germany, it's just a big discussion that depression is labeled burnout as a sort of a socially accepted um, construct, which is medically basically invalid. It's just a social category that just ca catched on in, in various social contexts because it's kind of flattering um, to be labeled a burnout victim. Um, and so the, the point here is just that, that we as human beings can live up or, or, and also live down to prevalent and powerful classifications of ourselves. 
So it's not at all an innocent business of how we label ourselves and how scientists frame their insights into human f uh, function and how drastic they present their results and what concerns from society they take up and choose to tackle with their um, research. So that's a, a complex process. And here's one guiding thought that I'm taking from the history of, or, or the, the legacy of critical theory. Um, and so that I think there's a connection between critical neuroscience and, and even a Frankfurt School approach to critical theory. And um, so this is, it's pr probably a bit complicated uh, put here, but it's the vocabulary from critical theory. And I would frame it like this in its efforts to uncover the first nature of human mental functioning, which, which means the ultimate material and functional level on which the mind is implemented. Neurosciences, in fact, influence and shape and even partly construct a kind of second nature. Second nature that are cultural practices, institutions, modes of conduct and ways of seeing that make up our social life world. So while neuroscientists assume or claim to put all the emphasis on first nature, the actual um, biological makeup of humans, they are in fact a powerful engine and driver of second nature. The biological materiality and functionality of the brain is deemed authoritative, both in terms of factual knowledge and increasingly also normatively. For example, in moral neuroscience, you have this very explicitly that, you th that, that people claim that when you look at the neurobiology behind moral reasoning and moral judgments, you actually can derive moral imperatives from the first nature in this case of human functioning, but it's in a, in a more probably subtle and tacit way in other areas of neuroscience as well. Whereas officially, culture, social practices, institutions, ways of talking and doing things are relegated to second string, are not as robust and important to, to this official, official view, which is often uh, most explicitly articulated by enthusiastic neurophilosophers who really make this distinction between the actual biological basis, which is a reality of human functioning, and say, well, the cultural um, dimension is just an added on, on dimension. So while in fact neuroscience is increasingly operative exactly on this discursive and practical and rhetorical level, so it's a kind of, it's not an outright delusion because I think most people have some sort of awareness here, but it's a, it's a tension between two tendencies. Um, World disclosure, knowledge generation about the real human reality, on the one hand, is in, is in a kind of dialogue and tension with a practice of world construction, world making, world interpretation that creates this second nature, this powerful cultural level on which much of what goes on in the human world um, actually takes place. So the danger you could see here is some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy while still on a premature, not yet export-ready level as a science, neuroscience becomes increasingly powerful as a cultural template which builds up specific material realities, lab spaces, scanner, scanner sites, equipment, hospital divisions, discursive formations, so, so ways of seeing and framing things that become increasingly prevalent. A whole array of material arrangements that solidify into a stable social reality. And of course, the very visible instrumentation, the scanner, and its products, the, the colorful brain images, have a player, um, a marked role here. So that is basically the, the idea that we take from critical theory. And Martin Hartmann, a philosopher from Frankfurt who now works in Switzerland, who explicitly applied this line of reasoning to um, a critique of neuroscience. And it's, uh, you can find this chapter also in, 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 the, in the volume. So it's the claim is that aspects of social reality start to solidify into something that will increasingly be difficult to change. What starts out as changeable open practice may end up being transformed into something that is at some point indeed nature-like as a solid institutional reality. And this reality uh, formats and affects and, 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 and basically shapes human beings that dwell in these structures. And that's the, the entry point for critique here that claiming what is in fact what, what is in fact man-made, changeable, historical, um, that, is, that, is, that, that is in fact rigid, um, that is a type of a uh, typical case of ideology. So what we need, according to this, is a reflexivity about the processes that, make, that, that made reality solidify into these ways and an openness towards alternatives 
um, and at least the, the claim uh, or the quest to have neuroscientific claims made transparent and have them justified in a social arena. So um, the export value, the social robustness of neuroscientific findings and application has to be demonstrated concretely, negotiated with those concerned by these uh, uh, um, advances and not just postulated by uh, technocratic elites. So here you have a little bit of a Frankfurt School legacy and I mean there are various ways in which we could frame this. One point that we think is particularly dominant is the notion of that, uh, or that values are inscribed into um, the first nature of the brain and um, so that here again is you, you have a kind of ideological smokescreen that brings forth certain types of value and that are then seen as natural, is basically demanded by the brain and um, well without seeing this process, without seeing um, how values are invested into the neural substrate, these things seem to be stable and unchangeable. So Hartmann speaks of normative first nature arguments, that is the, the way to draw normative authority from the actual makeup of the brain. And uh, if you look at the science and you see how, how premature particularly it is in the level of, uh, of mor moral neuroscience, where you, in a way you find all sorts of different and even diverging claims being supported by findings from neuroscience at this point. You see that this can quick quickly become um, an ideological argument. And um, so these natural ethical facts, as some people call them, are really a striking example. And um, well, this you, you can extend this program to something that basically concerns science as at large. And here I like to follow the perspective opened up by Joe Rouse, who advocates a cultural studies of scientific practices. And um, he's basically opposing the very solid assumption that there is a clear-cut distinction between the natural science on the one side and the human science or the interpretive. Uh, disciplines on the other side, and um, whereas science is just about the facts, whereas the way people should live together, society should be constructed, that that is a matter of human self-interpretation. And he, Rouse basically shows that this is, you, you can't stabilize this distinction, that, e that natural scientific practices are in the same way political because they structure um, fields of possible human action, transform our material surroundings and technical cap capacity and um, so the way nature is revealed shapes um, concepts and practices that make human action intelligible. And you can't draw a line here between the pure material world disclosure and um, human self-interpretation. So it's also an argument against Charles Taylor's neat distinction that you have the human sciences that are concerned with human self-interpretation on the one hand, and you, that you can somehow bracket this off from the natural sciences which deal with causality laws of nature, etc. So it, the upshot is that nature is itself a thoroughly political concept that always marks the difference in how we deal with things and people. And what's, what's interesting about Rouse is that, it's not, that this is not collapsing into a form of social constructivism where he, based, where he would dispute the, the truth value or robustness of natural scientific insights. Exactly not. It's rather that he says that, that, that Causality and 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 um, well, real friction with with reality is something that you find in natural science as well as in human self-interpretation. You have it everywhere. So, the, the truth value or or the the world disclosing aspect of our practices is not an issue, but rather that political issues that pertain to our our social life are at issue um, at all sorts of um, scientific practices, even. Um, in, in the human as well as in the natural sciences. And now, uh, Lawrence had all these historical um, data on the varying histories of the brain, and we also talked about a little bit about psychoanalysis in relation to neuroscience, and I'm, I, I, I tend to agree with what Ian said before, that there are parallels between psychoanalysis and the neurosciences today. Um, and it's, I think it's an interesting question why we today find, or why much of even intellectual culture finds neuroscience much more appealing than the Freudian story. But of course you have, you have this strange mixture between something that, is, that has academic pedigree, even 
pedigree as a science, it, it is accepted. But on the other hand, it it is a form of interpreting the most riddlesome aspects of what humans are, the soul, the, the depths of the psyche, etc. So you have this you have this simultaneity of something that seems like no bullshit science and the flattering aspect of being able to find deeper dimensions um, of the human soul, etc. Um, so now, and what I what I would just I just want to take this as a starting point, but because in retrospect it is quite evident to what immense extent assumptions, concepts, and practices of psychoanalysis were influenced by the quite specific cultural environment in which psychoanalysis was founded in bourgeois Vienna around 1900. And it's really amazing how much um, well exchange between the, the the concrete cultural situation and this approach was actually there. And I think you can make the same point, and that was what Lawrence already did with um, brain science uh, in general. You have these, well, this mixture, this amalgamation of biological, technological, and societal developments. And this is just, I think Lawrence said much more in there, this is just a small um, um, tendency here that you had the brain as a protoplasm or as an electrical switchboard, you had the telephone exchange, you have different kinds of computer, and you have this notion of hard wiring and coding uh, in the area of the Cold War. And today, of course, and that's what I want to talk about um, now a little bit, network capitalism as um, being the template or as some, some sort of, um, well, hermeneutic resource from which neuroscience draws many of its descriptions today. So we seem to have left behind both the localism, uh, localizationism of phrenology, the sort of modular mind, um, also hierarchical models and laws of development. Um, and of course, there were problematic models here about, um, well, different forms of degeneration or um, racial prejudice from colonial times projected into the brain. Some of this still lingers in, in some hierarchical models that we still find, and modularity is, of course, also not bad, but um, in a way, this is not the the dominant mode. Um, well, the, the Cold War brain, the well, strong methodological individualism, the notion of hard wiring, uh, rigid programming, computational codes, and um, it's 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 apparent how individualistic that that brain was, as opposed to today's brain, which is of course the brain of the network society. So the brain is said to be plastic and not just developmentally plastic at the beginning, but throughout the lifespan. It's adaptive, it's self-organized, it's non-hierarchical, it works without a center, it's, and it's, of course, immensely interactive in constant communicative exchange. Um, so the connectome is here, again, a, a good example where you basically you have to, in a crystallized, purified form, the idea of constant interaction and communication between uh, the billions of neurons here that you have in the brain. So today's brain is a social brain without center and executive command. And the computer, as long as the computer is, does still function as a model, then it is the model, of course, is the internet and uh, also web to zero applications such as Facebook. It seems that as if the brain is organized like a modern company whose employees are spread across the globe forming communicative networks and work autonomously in changing projects. And that's, of course, uh, the story that Malibu tells in her book, What Should We Do With Our Brain? And, um, well, that's, that would be the provocative question here. Does every historical period get its own, its proper brain? Is the brain indeed so plastic that social structure is directly reflected in its organization? And so that's what Malibu basically says. She, she says it, it should make us pause, first of all, that today's brain is formed or... or construed so readily in terms of social and emotional competencies, empathy enabling mirror neurons, in terms of plasticity, adaptivity, creative potentials, and also in terms of capacities that can be readily enhanced and optimized. And on the flip side, in terms of depletable resources, such as willpower and motivational energy, uh, with their characteristic breakdown patterns, of course, you also have in, in, in every historical epoch a, a set of characteristic mental illnesses that somehow have reached cultural dominance. Today it would be depression or burnout probably, but also neurogenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's. So, and, and then the, the claim would be that the, these come at a time where the spirit of capitalism um, 
basically is focused on the same sort of watch worlds, uh, watch words here, the soft pressures of the globalized economy, universal demand for adaptability, flexibility, and emotional intelligence, creativity, self-motivations, and communicative skills. So new values that are radically at odds with what was uh, called for in the work world of, let's say, 80 years ago. Um, so, and that's, Malabu's point is then, well, this brain seems to be of our own making. It seems to be a historical, cultural, and social product but we don't notice this. And it's of course an allusion to Marx that uh, humans make their own history but don't know it. And it's basically the same point um, applied to the brain. Humans make their own brain, but they don't know it. They assume that the brain is, is rigid. It's, it's a natural endowment that is just trans-historically stable. And then this becomes ideological because then the world order in terms of which we describe the brain today is naturalized, is vindicating as something that is inevitable, that is basically demanded by nature. And, um, well, Malabu uses this to frame it as a crucial question, basically addressing neuroscientists, asking, what side do you want to be on? So he, she's, she asks, does brain plasticity, taken as a model, allow us to think a multiplicity of interactions in which the participants exercise transformative effects on one another through the demands of recognition, of non-domination and of liberty. So that would be the plea for an emancipated understanding of the brain or of taking neuroscience as showing that there are more possibilities to realize than those demanded by contemporary capitalism. Or that's the other option neuroscientists might take. Must we claim on the contrary that between determinism and polyvalence, brain plasticity constitutes a biological justification of a type of economic, political and social organization in which all that matters is a result of action as such, efficacy, adaptability, and unfailing flexibility. So that's why she calls her book, What Should We Do With Our Brain? Um, there is still a choice uh, as, as regards to which side you want to be on. Is it just this sort of osmotic exchange between the social world and neuroscientific descriptions of the brain? Or can we recognize this interaction, reflect upon it, and see that there are different interpretations and different forms of action possible. Um, and I find this a helpful starting point for much of what we want to do. And then there are, the rest that I have is, is basically the, making the same point than Lawrence, that again, we are not talking here about simply a level of interpretation on the one side that is dis dis distinct from the true biology, but rather that we see now in various human scientific disciplines like evolutionary theory, like developmental psychology and, and, and other fields, that the biology culture divide is increasingly dissolving. A niche construction theory in, in evolutionary biology would be one example. So in, in, in these fields, there's a strong tendency to abandon the sharp separation of biological from cultural evolution. Niche construction theory claims that hominid evolution might have long entered a phase where adaptation to cultural constructed environments has taken a key role, basically overtaking classical biological evolution and driving further evolutionary development. Um, one classic example is Terry Deacon's ideas about language development. Obviously, language seems to have originated as a, as a cultural practice, a cultural invention, but then the brain obviously has adapted to that cultural structure. So. Um, and, and, and in that way, it makes little sense to ask whether brain structures relevant to language are a natural or cultural endowment of Homo sapiens. It's, 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 uh, well, it's entangled in the dialectics. And the, this book by, by Tim Sterony is quite interesting here. It's probably one of the best accounts of how hominid social practices came to shape evolution. And the, the, uh, the, under, the underline here is how evolution made humans unique, and it's all about the idea that certain practices, behavioral practices, or practices of tool making, practices of social organizations, such as apprenticeship models, that, were pr that can be shown by, by archeological evidence that they are pretty old in the hominid lineage, apprenticeship models of tool making or of, of foraging in social groups, that they have given humans an edge uh, versus other animals, and then of course, uh, created certain adaptive pressures in this niche construction um, um, sense 
so that the human brain um, was or became to or, or was was pressured in the direction of developing social capacities that facilitated these uh, kinds of social interaction. It's a kind of interesting idea. And Steroni knows how to style himself. He looks like Darwin with a laptop, so it's <laughs> basically um, manifesting his own theory very in very nicely. <laughs> and of course, here Lawrence is even on there on my last slide. So here we have some other work that points in this direction. So evidence from cultural anthropology su suggests that it makes sense to speak of local biologies, that cultural differences in certain psychological or behavioral traits might run as deep as reflecting differences in biology. And I think I don't have to go into that. Biolooping, we heard uh, Lawrence talked about cultural biologies. And these, I think, all point in that direction that we have to rethink the classical division between the natural and the human sciences. And while that, well, this is pretty, I, I can even leave this as a question. What does this, well, this level of insight into the entanglement of cultural practices and the bi biological makeup of humans, um, well, what, what does this entail for a self-understanding of scientific practices and for, an, uh, for, for a critical contextualization of neuroscience? And uh, just to end this, maybe some of you have, have encountered this paper, so it's all the more problematic in light of what we just heard that most neuroscientific studies, I think 98% of the studies that are done and, and are floated in major journals, are still conducted with weird people, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Um, so a population that is obviously not nearly representative of humanity. And um, well, and this is, this is basically the reality. And also, of course, not only that these are the subjects in the studies, but also that psychological categories are drawn from uh, a pretty narrow Western context and then exported and often also used as a template for, um, well, the investigation of, of brain structures. And uh, that, that's, an whole, that's a whole different perspective here that you can, you can really question where theory and concept formation comes from. And um, of course, a call would be for a much more balanced anthropological perspective um, to these issues. And that should be it for the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you.